Hey, good morning, Grove family. I'm so thankful that you guys joined us this morning for our online worship service. Pastor Phillips got an incredible message for you guys. And I know things look different because you're watching this wherever you're watching it from. And we're not actually at our church building. But we don't actually have to be at our church building to be able to worship together as one. So for worship this morning, we have something a little bit different. And I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you enjoy your worship experience with The Grove Online.
good Sunday morning to you, church, uh, and visitors, those that are watching us online. Uh, I'm so thankful that you're joining us here online. I'm sorry that once again we are online only this week, but next week we will begin our face-to-face -face services again at 9 and 11. And obviously we'll be online as well, uh, but we will be back at church together. And I know many of you are looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, our, our staff is looking forward to that. Uh, and so hopefully you use this week just to continue to protect yourself, uh, get better if you've been sick, uh, recover if you've had the COVID, uh, whatever it is, uh, use this week to get ready to go as we uh, get back together next Sunday at 9 and 11. And then the following week, we will start our Wednesday night services back for our students and for adults and CR and all the things that go along with it. It's been kind of a weird couple of weeks uh, as we've not been able to get together. Uh, and, and talking with a lot of folks that just are kind of at that place uh, in the season, uh, in the winter months, holidays are over. We've been going through this pandemic and uh, this online, in-person, all these different uh, things that we've had to do to adapt and to move and to make sure that we're being the best neighbors that we can. Uh, and a lot of folks are just kind of over it. It's kind of at that point to where it's like, man, I'm, I, okay, I'm over this. Uh, and I feel that I feel that as well. Uh, I understand where you are. And so let me encourage you and tell you, you're not alone this morning. There's many of us together, online together, that are worshiping together. Church is not the building. We are the church. However, it will be so nice when we can all get together inside of a building and worship together and overflow and just fellowship. It's going to be great. So let me encourage you with that first and say next Sunday you have an opportunity to do that at 9 or 11. Um, but this morning we're here together and we're studying. And once again, you're in the study. You're in my study. Uh, we chose to do this again uh, because it makes it a little more personable. Uh, I talked to a couple folks this week and they were like, dude, your face is all up in the screen. It is. I apologize. It's all I got. It's what God gave me. Uh, but maybe it feels like we're, we're having a little more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and hopefully that encourages you as well. This time during the service, normally, I would say, let's stay and let's read Scripture together. However, this morning, I'm going to read it to you, and I want you to read it with me uh, as we are in Philippians again, uh, Philippians chapter 3, and then we're going to be in Matthew once again as we talk about treasures. Two treasures I want to talk about this morning. Last week, we talked about treasuring Christ, and this morning, I want to talk about two more treasures uh, and not going to take nearly as long on, on the two that I did on the one. However, I want to talk to you about it. Remember what we've been talking about. Been talking about this idea of uh, vision for the future. What are you reaching for? What are you moving for? <clears throat> what is God stretching you to to become? And where is he stretching you to go? Now, Scripture says this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul said it. He said, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. And then he says in Philippians 3, 13, he says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many are as perfect, have this attitude. And this is the attitude that we have to have, is that we are moving forward. Last week we talked about uh, treasuring Christ. We talked about what it meant to treasure over the past two weeks. We talked about this understanding of stretching, that God would stretch us. Uh, we started to ask questions. You know, what, what is my vision? Uh, where do I see God leading me? Uh, we we kind of took this whole idea of vision and began to shrink it down. Uh, this is what I see. This is the vision. This is where I would like to see me go. These are the things that I have on my heart to achieve this year. And then we shrunk that down to say, what do I need to let go of, whether I've been carrying it for years uh, or I've been carrying it for last year, but what am I going to refuse to take into uh, the future with me? And as you reflect on that, maybe you're finding that that's been a little bit harder uh, to do uh, then maybe uh, I make it sound. It's hard to let go of things. It's hard to forgive things. But in order to heal healthy and to move forward, we must do those. And obviously, to get to where God wants us to be, we have to do those things. So where am I going? What do I see? What am I letting go of? And then here's the other, the third question that we asked was this. What do? Where do I see God taking me? 
Where is God's role in my vision, and what is he taking me to? It's one thing for me to say, this is where I see myself going. It's another thing for me to say, God, where do you want me to go? And I humble myself to that and let him, watch, stretch me. I'm reaching towards that. So he's stretching me. It's in these moments that our life begins to stretch. And obviously, we are pressing all of this message into just a couple of weeks on the front end of January uh, of a brand new year. But this idea of stretching is going to be months long into a whole new year. So uh, a little bit of stretching now, a little bit of stretching later. But overall, this year, he's going to stretch us to go and do things that we never could have imagined doing. And then we finished with this question of this, is what is my why? And then this is my how. It doesn't matter uh, how I do it if I understand my why. If I understand my why, I can deal with almost any how. So uh, once I know this is what I treasure, this is my why. My children, my wife, my church, my ministry, my friends, uh, my health, um, the, the, the mission of God on my life, whatever that why is, then I can deal with almost any how. And a lot of times when we're focused on our why, we will develop a how. This is the goal. This is how I'm going to get there. But then there's other times that we develop the why and God develops a why in us and our how changes. I couldn't do it that way. I had to do it this way, but I'm okay with it because I'm getting to my why. And so we've been developing those things over the past uh, couple of weeks. This morning, we continue with our why, the treasures. And I shared with you three treasures on the front end that are going to be the treasures of the growth. Ultimately, that's this is a top-down kind of treasury. As a leader, I'm saying this is going to be what we treasure as a church. And I'm going to lead uh, the church in this direction as a pastor uh, as a uh, member of this body, this is where we're going. But hopefully, these treasures, as they are ours all together, they become ours individually. Uh, there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that my personal treasure. And ideally, that would be the case. And so ideally, you would say, yes, Philip, I believe in our church treasuring Christ this year. Now you say, man, how in the world, why would a pastor have to tell his church to treasure Jesus? Well, because... Uh, is so easily to get distracted onto other things. A church exists for Christ. We're the bride of Christ. But so many times in life, we get our eyes focused on the things here and not on the things above. Conversely, that's exactly what happens in our own private life, is what should be our treasure as a follower of Christ, whether anyone else is doing it or not, should be Jesus Christ. But because of life, because of health, because of relationships, because of addictions, because of hurts, because of failures, our eyes begin to come down into daily life of distractions and not Christ. And so we go, nope, I want to treasure Jesus this year. He is my why. And I want to look like him. I want to talk like him. I want to uh, extend myself, my life to others like him. So he's what I treasure. Now, the two treasures that we're going to treasure along with Christ is this. We're going to treasure Jesus Christ. And then the second one is we're going to treasure people. The third one is, we're going to treasure the gospel this year. Jesus said it this way, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Uh, we are living in a day and time, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but I do feel like I need to speak into this just a little bit. I think if we were to take a snapshot of this moment, we were to take a snapshot of this time, what we would say is, is man, really, nothing matters except for what you do for Jesus Christ. Everything is up for grabs. The things that we uh, have held on to, have worked for, all the, can all be lost in just but a moment. And Jesus said this first. Here's what he said. He said, listen to me. Do not be so foolish as to live your life and to think that life is all about this stuff, this place, this area. Don't sell your soul to that. What does it matter if a man gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen to me. Don't put your soul in this stuff. This stuff will be gone. It can be taken away. People fight over it. There, there's all kinds of things that happen. It rusts, and ultimately it's going to be destroyed. But place your soul and place your efforts and place your prize, place your goal, watch, in things that will last forever, Christ, right? In things that will last forever. I was having a conversation with someone this week, and here's what I said. I don't want to 
waste my years. I don't want to spend my years building something that ultimately will go away. I was reading an article this week, and there was a man who is dying. He's got stage 4 cancer. Maybe you read it as well. I think it's kidney cancer, and he's already had lost one of his cancers, or one of his kidneys to the cancer. And what he began to do was he began to look at life as an ending. It's coming to an end. It's, it's amazing how uh, your health and uh, cancer and stage 4 and all these kind of things will bring that kind of into viewpoint where we should be thinking about it all day long. Realistically, you're born dying. We're all dying. It's just a matter of time that you take your last breath. And we've seen enough dying this year to last, uh, quite frankly, a lifetime. But we know that it, it won't get any better. It's probably only going to get worse. As you get older, you continue to lose people that are very close to you. This guy had a unique idea. He began to look through his life and he said, I can't take my money with me. I can't take my cars with me. I can't take my house with me. And what he began to do was, is he begins to, and he's doing it now, is he is meeting strangers. And as he has conversations with strangers, he gets them to agree to go get a tattoo together. The same matching tattoo. Now, this isn't about whether you like tattoos or don't like tattoos. It's just an illustration, okay? So don't freak out on me. But this gentleman was going with strangers and having the exact same tattoos placed on his body and their body to create a bond. And his message was this. He said, I'm going to leave this world and there's not many things that I can take with me, but I can take this experience and this mark into that box with me on my way out. And that person is going to take this experience and that mark with them on through life. We will always be tied together. I can't take these other things, but I can take that. Well, we ultimately know that he's not going to take his body with him um, into heaven uh, because the Bible says we get a new body. But I thought it was very unique in the understanding of when life seems to be coming to an end, man begins to think about what can I leave behind? And he's literally leaving a mark on individuals. Now let me ask you a question. Have you begun to think about life in those ways? How can you leave a mark on somebody? We've all been guilty of leaving bad marks on people, uh, leaving bad taste in their mouth, right? But what if we grow and we mature, we are forgiven of those things and uh, we begin to set our sights on leaving our mark. I began to talk with a friend of mine, and I said, listen, I don't want to build something that's going to fade away. I want to leave a mark. As I begin to look at where we're headed as a church, and I begin to see that we are building together, and we're building a new campus, and we're uh, going to move to that new campus, I don't want to just build a building. I want to build a place that's going to leave a mark. Johnny Hunt used to say, and still says, I'm sure, uh, leave this world better than the way you found it. Uh, we're beginning to see that there's only so many things that you can invest in that will laugh, last a lifetime and into the next uh, understanding of generations. And I'm asking you this morning, what are you doing to leave a mark? Some of us have been blessed beyond measure, and we're trying to figure out how we can leave our mark, um, but we're not leaving it very well. In fact, when they put us in that box uh, and, and it's all over, uh, John Ortberg used to say it all goes back in the box. When it all goes back in the box, some of us will be long forgotten. We never really left our mark. We invested in things that were beneficial to us, made our life better for the moment, maybe even uh, gave us pleasure for the moment. But when our life ended, it all ended. How can we be individuals who say, listen, I'm going to do some things and I'm going to have experiences and I'm going to have some things in life that are beneficial to me, but my ultimate goal is to leave a mark. I'm going to build something that when they place me back in the box, my soul's in heaven, that I've done everything that I could to leave a mark here. So as long as God tarries and doesn't return, until he returns, generation after generation will forever be changed. It's why I'm, I'm leading and you're leading this community, this church, to build a school that would absolutely develop young uh, believers of faith into uh, the future uh, that, that would change the world through Jesus Christ. Uh, it's why we are developing a, a, a campus that would be able to be used 24 hours a day uh, so that we could leave a mark here so that long after we're gone, it's still being utilized for the future. It's why we invest in feeding programs, and it's why we invest in missions, and it's why we go to Haiti and uh, Honduras and Nicaragua, uh, Greece, uh, uh, Kenya. We are investing. It's why a friend of mine, right before he passed, set up a 501c3 so that he might invest in shoes for souls. It's for souls, not for feet, 
Yeah, it's practical for feet, but it's for souls. It's a mark that will never be erased. It's why we raised money together to uh, purchase shoes uh, for, for our friends in Kenya. People we may never see again this side of heaven, but this morning they have feet or shoes on their feet so that they may know that the hands of Christ are there in a very tangible way. So I say to you this morning, as Christ said, don't store up yourself treasures here. Let's not invest in all, all of our stuff here. Let's look at our finances. Let's look at our health. Let's look at our time. Let's look at our schedules and say, how can I invest my time, my talents, my treasure, my energy, my money, my mind today so that long after I'm gone, it lives on for Jesus Christ's namesake. That's how we treasure Christ into the future. And two practical ways that we can do that is by treasuring people. See, this is what Jesus said. He said, but store up yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. We want to invest in a way that nothing can take it away. And one of the ways that we do that is by investing in people. We treasure people. They are our why. I'm going to do what I do because of people. I've noticed, and maybe you've noticed this as well, but we kind of live in a day time where people are kind of irritable with one another. Uh, people say things to people that they would never say before. We hold grudges a little bit longer. Uh, we say things on social media. Uh, people can, on one hand, praise Jesus Christ, at the same time, persecute uh, a fellow man um, in the same breath. It makes no sense. On one, uh, one sense, we can ask for forgiveness, and the other, we can refuse to give it. Uh, it doesn't really make sense, but that's the kind of day and time that we live in. So how do we combat that? How do we become people who treasure people? Well, Jesus said it this way. He says in Ecclesiastes 4.12, his word says this. He says, uh, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Uh, one of the, uh, Solomon's greatest proverbs is this. We need each other. We need people. Life was not meant to be lived isolated. It was not meant to be lived by pulling back. Some of you have been in isolation since this pandemic began. Some of us have been in isolation and out of isolation. Uh, maybe you don't use the word isolation. Let me use a word that you're very familiar with. Quarantine. Right? Quarantine will drive you crazy. Have you ever known? Here's what we say. I'm getting a little bit of cabin fever. Why? Because you need people, man. You need to be around people. God created us to be people who fellowship with one another, who spend time with one another. You need to be able to go play golf with one another, go shopping with one another, have lunch together, be able to go hunt together. There's something good for the soul being with one another, but there's something even greater going on with just being with one another. And that's really some of the angst. Some of us are really anxious because, man, this pandemic has taken some of our basic need of just fellowship away. And we look forward to it. We look forward to being back together once again. But you don't need it just for the fellowship of it. You need it for protection. We need one another. We are under a complete assault by the enemy. The prince of the power of this air hates who is in you, Jesus Christ. And because he hates who is in you, he is going to assault you. He is going to attack you. He's going to attack you mentally, physically, emotionally. He's going to attack your health. He's going to attack you in your pocketbook. He's going to attack you in ways that you can't imagine. He's going to attack your family. And you know what you need? You need friends. You need believers. You need people around you who can walk through the toughest times together with you. We must treasure people because this is what life is about. It's about looking after one another. And the Bible says, you know, uh, two men, you know, here, here's the deal, two can defend themselves. We can fight back to back. You know, I got your back. You got my back. We, <clears throat> we can fight back to back. And we see that in marriage is fighting back to back. Sometimes y'all get turned around, you're fighting each other, but we are intended to fight back to back. Uh, but then here's what happens. He says, but a court of three, a court of three is, quickly, is not quickly broken. We need not only just one friend, we need people around us who can fight with us, but who can lift us up, who can walk with us, who can tell us what we need to hear in the moment we need to hear it. I need encouragement. We need people in our life that can be sounding boards. We need people that in our life that can offer those words when we don't want to hear them, but we need to hear them. Uh, I had a friend tell me the other day, he said, I don't know that anybody else could say this to you, uh, but I'm going to say this to you, and I don't want you to be mad. And they shared something with me to encourage me. And to push me. And, and here's what I said back to my friend. Is I said, you don't make me mad at all. I need that. I need someone who 
who can be that person in my life. Uh, there's an accountability to it, but there's also strength in it. It helps us see our blind spots and it moves us forward. And so we want to treasure people because not only do you need it, listen, other people need it. Other people need it. Have you ever thought about this? When you're not investing your time in the church, in fellowship, in ministry, you're actually hindering other people. Let me encourage you with something. There are people who need you. God has equipped you a certain way with certain unique uh, understandings, a personality that only you have, right? Uh, and he has equipped you not only for himself, himself first, but then for other people. You're needed. We need you on the battle lines. We need you a part of this mission. We need you to treasure Jesus, and we need you to treasure people. We need you to come out of hiding. We need you to come out of uh, withdrawal. We need you to come out. We need you to be on board fighting back to back with the church of Jesus Christ, pressing into the future because darkness, listen, darkness cannot overcome light, but we need people of light, people who love Jesus Christ on the front lines fighting. And I ask you this morning, do you, do you treasure Christ enough to come out? Are you willing to do it? Man, life can upend you. Life can make you crazy. You can get your feelings hurt. You can do things that you're ashamed of. And Satan and all the darkness will push you off. You'll, you'll kind of retreat. You'll find your little crew of people and just go retreat and kind of waste your best years. But we got to press against that because, listen, the Bible is very true. We need soldiers of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about soldiers that are fighting earthly battles. We don't need that. What we need is people who are willing to fight for Christ. And you know how you fight for Christ? Christ don't need me standing outside fighting with my fist. Christ don't, uh, Christ don't need me out here, you know, with my Chuck Norris videotapes learning how to do the karate and all that stuff. He don't need all that. You know what he needs? He needs me fighting for his name's sake. He needs me out preaching the gospel. He needs me out sharing it with others. He needs me out leading with hope because of who created us and what Jesus Christ is doing. He needs us fighting by being the people of light in the midst of darkness. You don't take a, a candle and light it under or hide it under a bushel. You don't do that. You let your light shine before men. So come out. Join the fight by treasuring people. The Bible goes on and says this. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. One of the ways that we show the world that we are people of God is by loving other people. This is how we treasure. One of the ways that you show the face of God is by loving people. People want to see God movement. People, people want to see the evidence of God. You know how they see it? Through the love of, of his people towards others. And the Bible says God lives in us <clears throat> and his love is made complete in us. We need to be people who treasure Christ and who people who treasure other people and make much of him by loving people. When people see you loving people, they see the love of God. You make much of him by loving others. And it's hard to love some people, man. It's hard to. It's a lot easier sometimes uh, to be mad or angry or frustrated, to work behind the scenes to hurt somebody or to clip their wings or to give them what they deserve. That's the easier thing to do sometimes. But sometimes it's hard to love people that don't deserve it. It's hard to love people that have hurt you. It's hard to love people that you've disagreed with. It's hard to love people that you don't identify with. It's hard to love people that you don't feel like you have much in common. But it's in those moments of stretching, remember? We're reaching where God's stretching us to go and to love people, not because of who they are, but because of who Jesus Christ is. And as you love people, right, as you love them, you're showing the love of Christ. You're literally showing God. And so we want to, right, uh, we want to show the love of God to other people. Let me ask you a question this morning as we're here together. Who are you struggling to love? Who are you struggling to love? Who, who, who do you struggle with um, to really forgive, to let go of some things? Who are you struggling? You know, I was sharing in a group this week, and one of the questions that we ask when we have fear is this, what's the worst possible scenario? A lot of times when we're in fear, we work we, worst possible scenario, and if you want to control fear, go to the worst possible scenario and work your way back. The reason is because most of the time when we're scared, the worst possible scenario is not what's going to happen. So if I can recognize that, and then what we do is we look for evidence in there. Is there evidence of this happening? Is there evidence of this? 
and then begin work my way back, I begin to calm down and realize, okay, all right, I don't really need to be as fearful as I thought. The truth is, uh, sometimes when we're struggling to love with pe- love people, we need to ask that same question. What's the worst possible scenario if I love this person, if I show this person love? And you need to understand, too, showing somebody love doesn't necessarily mean you have to have lunch every day. It doesn't mean you have to go by their house every week. It doesn't mean you have to always send them a card. It doesn't mean any of that stuff. But it does mean letting go of hate and anger and grudges and unforgiveness in the love of Jesus Christ. And what's the worst possible scenario in that case? Well, I mean, really, what is it? If you open yourself up to show love, to show kindness, to show grace, they might get away with what they've done. They, they, they might think they're somebody. They, they may think I'm easy to walk over. They may, they may think there's no consequences. Listen, you in and of yourself can't bring about any of that anyways. That is only going to be brought about by Christ. And what we must do is, is let go of those things and let God work. And so what we can do is, is we can rest in the love of Christ that he has for us. And by resting in the love of Christ because of the way he loves us, we can love others. Jesus said, love your enemies. In fact, the Bible says, not only love your enemies, but do good by them. You want to be stretched? Try to do something good for someone who is considered your enemy. It will stretch you, man. It will put you in a place. But in those moments, we're leaving room for the work of God in their life, in our life as well. So let's let God do that. Let's love people despite what they've done or their actions. And let's let God work through that. The Bible goes on and says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. As we determine, this is our why, I'm going to treasure people. Uh, We have to learn how to bear with one another. Man, it's hard to bear with some people. Just go on a drive later today. Get on the interstate, right? Uh, go to a gas station and have to wait uh, behind several people because they're, uh, you know, taking their time at the register. Go through a drive-through and uh, pull up to that second uh, window, and then pull up to that second spot because the fries aren't done. Like you caught them off guard. They sell fries, bro. You should have them, right? We struggle to bear with one another. We don't do real well sometimes bearing with our husbands or wife or with our children, with our boss, uh, with our church, uh, with these circumstances. It's hard to bear with somebody. But the Bible says that you bear with people. Listen, here's how you do it. Humility, gentleness, and patience. If you want to learn how to better bear with people, because sometimes people get on our last nerve. They push me to the very end. And it begins to eat into the understanding of treasuring people. I just don't like them. They, they rub me the wrong way. He takes extremes amount of humility and humbleness, right? Gentleness and patience to bear with people. Maybe you're married to somebody that just, I mean, it's, it's, it's a struggle right now. But maybe God's calling you to bear with them in humility and gentleness and patience because he's working on them. They're not who he wants them to be yet, but he is working on getting them there. Don't give up. Bear with them. Maybe you have a neighbor that you can't bear with. Maybe there's somebody of a different political viewpoint that you can't, you can't stand right now. And the enemy is using it to divide you. Listen, let's bear with one another in humility and gentleness and patience, right? And it is, listen, in this understanding of love for one another and in bearing with one another, watch, this is so good. It preserves the unity. How does unity get taken away? How do we break unity? We stop bearing one another. I'm not dealing with that. I'm not dealing with them. I'm not, I'm not doing that. We don't bear with one another. And so the Bible calls us in our treasuring, uh, as you walk like Christ did, to bear with one another. If you think about the relationship that Jesus had with his disciples, you know, if you go through, if you want to, if you don't have anything to do today, if you watch football, if you've done whatever, read through the Gospels and read the conversations that Jesus and his disciples had. And then read how his disciples acted certain times, the questions that they asked. A lot of times we get scripture that has been broken down by Jesus a second time and sometimes a third time because the disciples who were there visually seeing and hearing Jesus Christ didn't understand it. As I read it, I know there were times that Jesus was like, I'm going to smack you in the in the Holy Spirit, man. I'm going to smack you with the word. I mean, you're killing me, right? You what? Are you nuts? But he doesn't. Now, there's times that he calls them down. And there's times that he rebukes them. There's times that we must do that in bearing with one another. I love you, but you need to understand this. 
But Jesus never gives up on them. In fact, in the worst days of Christ's life, if you could even say it that way, uh, the night before he's taken into custody, the night of the, the moment he's taken into custody, he's washed their feet, he's had dinner with them, and he goes, I need y'all just to watch with me. Just be with me. You remember that whole verse in Ecclesiastes where two can defend and three are not quickly broken? Hey, I need you three. I need the rest of y'all stay here. You three come with me. I need you just to watch with me. Help me not be broken. Help stay with me. Pray for me. And these jokers go to sleep. Now, most of us would have just wanted to go up and go, What? You don't love me enough? Jesus bears with them. And he loves them. And he stays with them. And he continues to see the best in them. Who in your life do you right now that you're struggling to bear with? Who are you? Because, see, you're bearing with them, expecting them to change. But maybe God's saying, Bear with them as I work on humility and gentleness in your life and humbleness in your life. Bible goes on in treasuring, treasuring people. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. Listen, we want to love each other. Listen to the Bible says in 1 Peter 4. Love each other deeply. Deeply. We are quick to in relationships and people because they, they do something we don't approve of. They have a certain sin. Whatever it is, but listen, the Bible says that there's a love. It covers a multitude of sins. Sometimes people say, I don't know how you could be their friend or how you can stick with them. How, listen, I love them. I don't know how they could uh, go to your church. They love me. We love one another. Love has the ability to look over certain things. It doesn't mean that it takes away the consequences and it doesn't mean that it uh, offers uh, 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 something that is inconsequential to them. It doesn't mean that, but here's what it does is it means that I love you so much that those things are not going to keep me from loving you. It's like a, a parent to a child. We, are, If you're a parent and you're raising children, you understand your children are not perfect. They make mistakes, and sometimes they do things that you are mortified about. But you know what? You go to bed loving them, and you wake up loving them. Why? Because they're your children, and you love them. And as life goes on, you don't continue to bring all that stuff back up. Why? Because that love covers a multitude of sins. Maybe you're struggling right now with your husband, your wife, your friend, your boss, your church, whatever. But maybe it comes back to you. Man, we got to dig in here and love deeply. John 15, 12 says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Romans 12, 10 says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Ephesians 4, 32 says the opposite of that is, is that, um, excuse me, Galatians 5, 15 says the opposite of that is, is if you bite and devour one another, take care that you do not consume one another. Love and treasuring people is the antidote to what we see in life, where we fight and fuss and just backbite and consume one another. I mean, it doesn't take, turn your TV on. We are literally consuming one another. We are literally, it doesn't matter. We are just literally enraged at one another. And the only answer to all of this madness that we're living in is love. But not man love, Christ love. It's the love of Christ that dwells in us to love one another. So who are you struggling to treasure? How can we treasure people? How are we going to treasure people this year? The Bible says this, love your neighbor as yourself. How can you treasure people? We treasure Christ. We treasure people. How are we going to do it? Well, a couple of things that we want to do this year is check in and on each other. A very practical, tangible way to treasure people is check on them. Check in on them. Make a list of people you want to check on. Uh, every week I have a list of names that I want to write letters to. Um, and a lot of times it's a one-way correspondence. I write a letter, I don't hear anything back. That was how it was intended to be. I wanted to send someone a letter. You said, well, why don't you text them or email them? I think there's something very personal about getting a pen out and a, and a, a note out and writing someone's name and writing, this is what I'm thinking, I'm thinking and send it to them, right? Uh, there are people that I check in on. I can't check in on everybody and not everybody can check in on me, but I go through those and uh, it's very encouraging randomly through the week when somebody randomly texts, checks me and just says, What's up, P? What's up, Philip? What's up? What's going on? Just checking on you, man. Uh, it's a way of just saying, Hey, I'm here for you. I love you um, and uh, miss you. Uh, it, it does the soul good. So let's treasure people in a very simple, practical way by checking in on each other. Another practical way to treasure people is this kill gossip. It is so easy to gossip. So easy to share things. It's so so easy to, to
to perpetuate stories or things that you've heard. I mean, just think about all the different social media things that we have now or internet things where we can just go in just to read the daily gossip. I mean, this world has known that forever. And some of you guys that are listening don't realize there was a day and time that you could not get all your news on an iPad or a tablet or whatever it might be or computer. Uh, but we would go through the grocery store. Y'all remember this? And they'd have all the magazines there on the way out as you were checking out, the Inquirer, all these different kind of things. And it had the most salacious stories, you know, something about the king and queen. Man, I don't even, I don't even live in England. I don't, I don't know, but I'm drawn in. I want to know, right? Reader's Digest. You know, I, it's it just is something just just so fantastic about knowing something about somebody else and then sharing it. But one of the greatest ways that we can treasure people is by killing gossip. Sometimes I tell people this. It's not my story to tell. And if they want you to know, they'll tell you. So we have to kill gossip. Number two, number three is this. Let's show grace to one another. Practical way to treasure people is to show grace to people. Um, grace is uh, getting what you don't deserve. So how can you treasure people by showing grace? Uh, we live uh, in a world that's broken. We live in a world with broken people. Uh, but how can you show grace? How can you how can you approach the unlovable? How can you move in when somebody else doesn't like somebody or somebody else is going through something and show them grace? Um, you know, this world is all about canceling. It's all about crushing. It's all about silencing. It's all about doing all that stuff. But let's be the opposite of that as Jesus Christ's uh, hands and feet. And let's move into the least of these. Let's love people. Listen, I've, I've seen it over and over and over. Be careful who you withhold grace from because of their actions or what was done to them. Because in time, you may find yourself in the same situation. So one of the greatest ways that we as a church body... We as individuals can show uh, that we treasure people is by showing grace to somebody. Show grace. Show the, show the grace that you were given by Christ. Number four is this. Refuse to compete with others. Refuse to compete. This year as we go in and we want to treasure people, I'm not going to compete with people. I'm not trying to be them. I'm not trying to keep up with them. I want to be me. Uh, but this world, I, I'm just telling you, it creates this competitive atmosphere. So let's, let's refuse to compete. Let's genuinely... Here's how you can refuse to compete. Genuinely be happy for somebody. Can you not be genuinely happy for somebody? What if they do something that's fantastic? Hey, genuinely be happy for them. Nat naturally, we start thinking about, well, I know how they got that job. Well, I know where they get all their money. I don't know. But why can't we just genuinely be happy for somebody? And as we're genuinely happy for somebody, it's amazing how that begins to grow a relationship that God can use greatly. That jealousy, that envy, that competitive understanding, my kids are better than your kids, my degree is better than your degree, my house is, whatever. Listen, it goes nowhere but destruction. It divides people, and a house that's divided will fall. So we can remedy that in unity by genuinely being happy for one another. Love people where they are. Man, I wanted to say that all morning. As we treasure people, Make it your mission this year to love people where you are. Can I tell you something? Lean in. You're not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. You are not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ dwells in you. Don't play that role. But let Christ use you loving people where they are so that He and the Holy Spirit can turn them in to who He desires them to be. Stop forcing people to meet certain standards to earn your love. Love them where they are. It's amazing how when we love people where they are, God will use His love to get them to where He wants them to be and to be who He wants them to be. Love them where they are. Love them um, just right in the midst of their most unlovable moments. And let that love tenderize their hearts so the love of Christ, the Holy Spirit, can transform them into who they need to be for him. Uh, here's a way that we can treasure people. Three quick, real quick, uh, meet someone's needs. Let's not just talk about it, but let's meet it. Let's meet their needs. I love our church. Our church is all about meeting needs. Uh, when I first got here, we had to have a meeting on the meeting on the meeting on the meeting of the meeting of the needs, right? We had to make sure that we could spend the money to turn on that light. We don't do that anymore. 
Uh, we are a church that says if there's a neighbor in need, we're going to meet that need. We're not a good neighbor because we saw the need. We're a good neighbor because we meet the need. And you know what's incredible? Over the past several years, we've seen that kind of love and treasuring people establish other people to do the same thing. It's great. I don't, I don't want us to ever negate when somebody else goes, hey, I want to go feed somebody. They start their own ministry to feed somebody. That's great. That's what we are here for. We are here to lead out change by encouraging other people to join us in this battle. We don't own the market on uh, ministry. We don't own the market on these particular things. Uh, we don't own the market on any of that stuff. We own the market on the love of Jesus Christ, right? And we own it because we're the God's children. But that means there's so many of us all around this world. We need to one another meet needs. Man, that's one of the things I'm so proud about our church. You are a need meter. Can I say that? I did. You meet needs, church. And let's continue to do that. And the way that we do that is by giving, by being present, by recognizing and doing it. And we meet needs. So let's meet needs. Look around your neighborhood. Look around your home. Who's somebody that needs uh, needs something uh, met? They're needing something. And let's do that. Let's go after it. Let's do it. You don't always have to do it through the church. Just do it. Um, yesterday I was uh, working to uh, pick up some stuff for uh, a gentleman that, that literally didn't have uh, some basic needs like clothes. Right? Didn't make a big deal about it. You just go do it. Give it and go. We can do that daily by treasuring people. I wasn't even thinking something I had to pray about. There's a person in need, you do it. Let's do that. Uh, be people who pray for one another. We're going to tra- treasure people by praying for them. Do you have a prayer list? Do you pray for folks? Hey, guys, men, I'm talking about men. Do you pray? Besides at lunch and dinner, breakfast, do you pray? Do you have somebody you pray for? Do you pray for me? Do you pray for your friends around you? Do you pray for your church? Do you pray for your children? And the last way that we're going to treasure people is this. We're going to invite people in. We want to invite people in. We want to invite people into our life. We want to invite people into church. Hey, don't, listen, don't keep this a secret. Let's invite people. When you get off this uh, service today, get on your phone and let's treasure somebody. Who's somebody that you go, listen, I'm going to church next week at 9-11, wear wear my mask. We're going to be as careful as we can, but I'm going. And hey, Bob, I wanted to see if you wanted to go with me. Will you join me next week? I, I got to get out of this house and I'm going. Uh, let's invite people in. Let's invite people into our lives. Let's treasure them by not keeping them at arm's length, but inviting them in to do life with us. How can they do life with us? By coaching ball, uh, by going on the lake with us, by joining us on hunting trip. How can you invite people in? Uh, it's real easy to be sheltered and keep people out. Uh, sometimes you hear people say this, I don't need any more friends. Um, well, you might. All right? So let's invite people in. Let's treasure them. The third, the, third, the third way we're going to treasure this this year is we're going to treasure Jesus first, treasure people, number two, and then number three is we're going to treasure the gospel. Real simple this morning, real simple as I wrap up. I want us to be a people who treasure the gospel. Jesus says this. He says, don't treasure stuff on this earth because it's all going to be destroyed, but let's put our treasures in heaven. And the greatest news is that Jesus Christ died for you and rose again so that we might join him in heaven. He saved us from our sin. It's the gospel message. It's the good news. We must be people who treasure that gospel message. And we don't treasure it by keeping it to ourselves. When I treasure Jesus, man, I want people to know about him. And when I treasure Jesus, I treasure people because I want people to know about him. But when I treasure Jesus and I treasure people, I treasure the gospel because Jesus Christ was about the gospel. Here's a question. When was the last time you shared the gospel? When was the last time you truly had a conversation about spiritual matters with someone who needed it? They needed the gospel. Somebody uh, may say, well, I don't know how to share the gospel. The gospel is the good news. It's a real simple story. Now, we can make it real complicated, but we're not building rockets here. We're working in people's lives so that they may know Christ. Don't make it any more complicated than you have to. Here's the issue. God created man. Man sinned. Man couldn't do anything for his sin. In fact, sin lives on. It's why we are the way that we are today. It's why we have the issues that we have. But God so loved the world and the people of it, his creation, that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die so that all men 
that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That is the gospel. The gospel is you are lost and you can't do anything about it. You need a savior. Jesus is him. That's the gospel. And we have to treasure that. We don't treasure that by burying it and covering it up. Remember the story that Jesus told about the man who found the treasure in the field and he went away and he sold everything he had. He came back and bought the field. He didn't buy the field to keep the treasure covered. He bought the field to get the treasure. This is it, guys. As we move into this year, I mean, this world is full of bad news. This this world, this, last year, so far this year, it's just been one negative thing after another. Turn the TV on. It's negativity. It's all there. It's bad, bad, bad. It's always negative. So, something else is happening. <coughs> Waiting on the other shoot it off. And we as believers have the greatest news ever, the gospel. The Bible says this, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 1.16 says this, and here's what Paul said in Romans. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for by it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. So are you ashamed of the gospel? Surely you'd say, no, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm proud of the gospel. Proud to be a Christian. But have you unpacked the understanding that it has power? That is, the children need the gospel. They need to know about Jesus Christ. They need salvation. Mom, your kids, your husband, they need the gospel. Dudes, your friends, the people you play golf with, the people that you go hunting with, the people that you do life with, that you coach with, that you work with, they need the gospel. And the Bible says this. He said, whoever believes shall not perish. That God so loved us that he sent his son. I want us to be a people this year that are so sensitive about the gospel that we walk around with eyes that are absolutely focused on those who may not know him. It's so easy to just kind of buddy up with fellow believers and live inside that bubble. It's so easy to do that. It really is. We go to church with them. We do Sunday school with them. We do life with them. That's our crew. There's nothing wrong with that in the sense that we need fellowship. Quarter three is not quickly broken. We need that. But if all we ever do is live in this bubble, then the only people ever going is us. But there are people around us that need the good news. Our grandparents, our family, our parents, our children, our people that we love. And there's no way, no better way to love and treasure Christ and to treasure people and to treasure the gospel than by telling the greatest news ever told. So this year I'm challenging you to treasure the gospel. How are we going to treasure the gospel? Come some practical ways. Share your testimony. Share your testimony. Maybe it's hard to treasure something you don't have. I'm not calling you on the carpet. Don't hear me say that. But maybe it's hard to treasure something you don't have. Maybe this message is not about treasuring the gospel for others. Maybe it's about treasuring the gospel for you. Then can I ask you a question? Do you know that you know Christ is your Savior? Do, do you know? Are you a believer? Have you come to a place to where you've repented of your sins and got to the place where you say, Christ, I need you to save me. I want to live a life for you. I want you to uh, take over my life. I want to follow you. Friend, if you've never done that, your treasure starts here at the foot of the cross by becoming a follower of Jesus Christ in repentance. And if you do that this morning, I want you to let us know at the Grove. We'd love to walk with you through that. We'd love to see you become uh, baptized. Uh, we'd love to see that happen. But once you have that story, and for some of you, uh, I tell the story of my, my I was nine years old eating, eating uh, dinner on a Mr. T TV tray. And in my study at church, I've got that TV tray. A friend of mine, a couple in the church, gave me a Mr. T TV tray. That was when I was born again. That was when Christ came to dwell in me. It's my gospel message. It's my testimony. And from that day to this day, I've done a ton of sinning. But one thing's for sure, Jesus Christ has never left me nor forsaken me. And the Bible says that, that when we are placed in his hand, nobody, nothing can take you out of his hand. But what's your testimony today? No one can argue with your experience. So we're going to share our testimonies. We're going to share. I want you to think of somebody you can share your gospel experience with this week. We're going to look for, here's a way that we're going to treasure the gospel. Look for intentional 
gospel-centered conversation. Spiritual, let's have Christ-centered conversations. Um, you work with people that you work with for years. Why won't you ask them about their spiritual condition? I'm nervous. It's none of my business. Well, sure it is. It's your business. You talk about everything else. You talk about what you're eating, what's going on at, uh, on at, uh, at home, uh, people that are sick in their family. You talk about everything. So let's talk about their soul. How are you? Tell me about where you are. Let's be people who look for intentional gospel conversations. It won't ever come up if you're not looking for it to come up. But you know what I found? Is I can have a spiritual gospel conversation when I'm looking for it and lead into it. Let's have those conversations. Let's begin to have those conversations at Cracker Barrel and at work and over coffee, through text. Let's, let's challenge one another. Let's press into our friends. Life is short. Let's not wait till it's over and wish we had. Let's set a goal. I would love for you to do this this morning. Set a goal to invite someone to church. Write down about four or five people's names or families that this year you are making them your treasure for the gospel. You want to see them worship with you. And then let's work towards inviting them. Maybe you invite them next Sunday. Like I said, pick up the phone. Will you join me? We're doing back uh, face to face. We got a new church building coming up. I'd love for you to join me at that. But let's go experience it right now and let the Holy Spirit work. Let's put people down that they are the folks that we're going to love this way this year with the gospel. We want to invite them to do life with us and at church with us. And then let's make it a, a list of people that we know this year that don't have a saving grace knowledge of Jesus Christ. They're not a follower of Christ. They're our friends. They're our acquaintances. They're our family members. But man, we're going to love them enough this year that we're going to say, I'm going after them. I want them to know Jesus I want them to, to know the love that I know in Jesus Christ. And I want to share that with them. I want to make those, those uh, practical, tangible applications to treasure in the gospel. Here's three things I want to tell you. Four things I want to give you. Uh, no, no, three. Three. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. It's just like church. I get kind of distracted. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to treasure the gospel three, three specific ways. Number one, as I finish, love God's word. We want to make God's word a priority in our life. I'm treasuring Jesus Christ. I'm treasuring people. I want to treasure the gospel. This year, folks, let's make the Bible a priority. Let's get in a small group. Let's get in a Bible study. Let's make the Bible a priority. Let's download a podcast. Let's download the Bible on our phone. Let's do whatever we have to do to weekly spend time in God's Word. Let's love God's Word. And then number two is this. I'm going to love the gospel. I'm going to treasure Christ. I'm going to treasure people. I'm going to treasure the gospel by, watch, being faithful to his church. I am going to be faithful to his church. Some of us have gotten out of church over the past year or two years. Let's get plugged back in and let's be faithful to his church. Let's attend. Let's make it a priority. Let's get our kids back in. Let's go to church together. And then number three is this. Let's talk about Jesus daily. Let's talk about Jesus daily. It's a real simple goal. A goal that we're going to make is this. I'm going to have a conversation about Jesus every single day. Every single day, Jesus is going to come up in my conversation. So I want to thank you for joining us for church this morning. Now remember, next Sunday we're going to be together, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, live and in person at the Grove. And of course, if you can't join us there at 9 and 11 in person, you can join us online. Now let me take some time. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to take up our tithes and offerings. And I want to encourage you to go to PushPay. And use this time right now to give. Uh, the mission of the church continues to go. And in one of the ways that we treasure Christ, treasure people, and treasure the gospel is by giving. Uh, we're going to give our times, talents, and treasures. And so let's give big, man. Uh, this is going to be the year. I'm telling you right now, 2021 is going to be the greatest year in the history of the Grove. Not only are we going to move into a new uh, campus, I think we're going to see the greatest growth we've ever seen. But it's only going to happen if you give of your time and treasuring people and give of your talents so we meet the practical needs of others. Listen, I love you, and I'm so proud of you, and I can't wait to see you face-to-face -face next Sunday. Let's give. Push pay. Take your phone out. Let's do it right now. Let's all give together, uh, and let's watch God move this week. I'm praying for you. Pray for me. Pray for your church, and I will see you next Sunday morning. Let's pray together. God, I love you. Thank you so much this morning for your word, and I pray that you would absolutely use it to change lives. Take these tithes and offerings that we give this morning, and make them go further than we could possibly imagine. As we treasure you, we treasure people, and we treasure the gospel. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.